Lord, our Lord, how excellent is thy name in all the earth. Why don't you give God the praise today? Not just for what he's done, but most importantly for who he is. This is the day the psalmist says the Lord has made. We ought to rejoice and be glad in it. Welcome to all of you who are connected to us today virtually. And all of you who are in the house with us this morning, we appreciate your presence. We are still pretty much virtual now, other than first Sundays, anticipating beginning again our regular worship in-house schedule and in-person schedule the first Sunday of September. Those of you who are with us on our website, ProvidenceBC.com, thank you for joining us today. Our provider is BoxCast. Thank you to all of you who are on YouTube, our channel, Providence Baptist Church College Park, and all of you who are on Facebook Live, Providence Baptist Church College Park. Turn on your notifications, hit the like and share buttons, let others know that you are worshiping with us at Providence today. Again, welcome to you and to all of you who I see in the house with us this morning. We want to start with the singing of a great hymn of the church. I am thine, O Lord, 358 in our in-house hymnals. I am thine, O Lord. Let's lift our voices.
Our scripture this morning comes from the New Testament book of Romans, the 12th chapter, verses 1 and 2. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, <clears throat> that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Amen. Let's bow for prayer. Father God, we thank you for this another day and for the privilege of gathering both physically and virtually, God. We lift up all that is said and done today because you are worthy of the praise and the glory. And we pray that what we do, what we say, and what we sing would give you glory and advance your kingdom in the earth. God, please use us as your instruments today. We come before your throne ever thankful for the many blessings that you have bestowed upon us. And what we do today is a result of the fact that we have considered what you have done and who you are. And we lift our voices to shout hallelujah and thank you in the house, both physically and virtually today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you again, all of you who are gathered with us in the house today and those of you who are with us virtually on ProvidenceBC.com, YouTube, and Facebook Live. We appreciate your presence with us today. Listen, if you are watching us virtually, uh, I encourage you to make sure that there be no distractions in your homes as uh, we conduct this worship service today. I hope you have placed everything to the side and that you will give your full time and attention to what we do in behalf of the kingdom of God today because God is most certainly worthy of that. We are who we are and what we are because of God. There are several announcements I want to share with you today. I want to remind you that we will be having prayer tomorrow corporately at 6 a.m. Please join us then. If you do not have the phone number and passcode, go to uh, our website. Or for those of you watching us virtually, that, that information should be on your screens at the moment. Our summer cycle class, we've got one adult discipleship class during the summer cycle as opposed to multiple classes. That class is on justice, uh, how justice is exercised by God in the word and how we should apply the justice of God to our own personal circumstances. That will be at 11 o'clock today. Go to the church website, ProvidenceBC.com and you can join that Zoom class on justice. Uh, Bible study continues this week. I believe it's lesson 12. Lesson 12 on overcoming fear will be taking place on Facebook Live at 12 noon this coming Wednesday. Virtual worship continues next Sunday at 9 a.m. Tune us in on ProvidenceBC.com, YouTube, or Facebook Live. Our food bank again will be open Saturday and my thanks to all of those who are responsible for the food ministry that takes place every Saturday from 10 till 12. I mentioned last Sunday that um, we had received a grant from the Atlanta Community Food Bank uh, to enhance our services of food ministry here. Uh, at first, that grant was determined to be 10000 but the Atlanta Community Food Bank uh, graciously added another 5000 to that. So it's a $15,000 grant. And that extend my thanks to uh, Sister Dolores Rollins and all of the other wonderful people who uh, lead our food ministry here at Providence. Amen. Uh, what else do I have to share with you? This coming Thursday, uh, Associate Minister Night, 6 p.m. on Facebook Live. Our sermon this week will be shared by uh, Elder Dexter Redding. That will be Thursday at 6 p.m. 
All right, that concludes just about all of our announcements. We do have thank you cards. First from Arena Williams. Continue to keep her in your prayers, please. And from Sister Vicki Henderson. And we appreciate the, these members of our church whom we have asked you to continue to be in prayer for. The prayer list, list should be on your screens uh, wherever you are watching us today. Let me mention some names in particular for our prayer list. Brother Rufus Jordan, whose family celebrated the life of Brother Jordan's brother this past weekend. So be in prayer for Brother Rufus Jordan and family, the family of Shakira Gavin, and uh, the family of Priscilla Jones, whose grandson died a little more, I believe, than a week ago. We want to keep these and the other families whose names you see on the screen today in our prayers. Finally, let me thank you for your contributions, the consistency of your giving. You have positioned us uh, to continue to try to make improvements on our building. We, uh, we have begun the process of um, changing our boilers and we will be, uh, that process will be complete before the winter comes. Uh, and I appreciate what you have given to help make that possible. That uh, job is about $165,000, I believe. So we need your continued support for the building fund. We've also begun the process of remodeling the church chapel, and that's about a $35,000 job. And so thank you for what you have given. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, the world and they that dwell therein. But we also believe that because everything belongs to God, that the scriptures teach us to give God the tenth and beyond our tithes and offerings. Thank you for the giving of the tenth each week. For those of you who are tithers by giving, uh, please don't forget your offerings above and beyond the tithe for our building fund, our scholarship fund, our youth ministry, our food bank, uh, and our mission ministry. We appreciate your generosity in all of those areas, and we pray that God would take what you give and continue to multiply it to his glory and honor. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. We are now, I believe, just about ready for the word of God. And Brother Kevin Bass is coming at this time. Come on, put your hands together and give God praise for Brother Kevin Bass.
Kevin Bass today. Thank you, Brother Bass, for your ministry. Today we give God praise for your wonderful gift. I'd like to begin a new series, a new preaching series today, Providence, and it will focus on the first two verses of Romans 12 uh, and more particularly on verse number two of Romans 12. Reverend Lee has read those two verses. I want to reread them. Romans 12, verses 1 and 2, and we are reading today from the King James Version. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. That's Romans 12 verses one and two. May God bless the reading of his word. We are concentrating on verse 2 of Romans 12 in this preaching series. And be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. That is the focus of this series. I want to talk today about renewing the mind. Renewing the mind. Well, our text verses today come from Romans 12 verses 1 and 2, and uh, a greater attention being paid to verse 2. And I want to begin by saying that Romans 12 is significant in that it presents to us from Paul's pen a shift in emphasis. Romans 12 signifies a shift in Paul's in emphasis. Note that particularly by looking at verse 1 of Romans 12, which says, I beseech you, therefore. Whenever you see a verse begin with therefore in scripture, it means that you are about to hear in some ways a summing up of everything that preceded it. I remember hearing years ago someone say, and I've said it here multiple times, whenever you see the word therefore in scripture, that you should pause to see what it's there for. He begins again in verse 1 of Romans 12 with the word therefore. Now, that means that in the previous 11 chapters, Paul was providing an overview of Christianity. So chapters 1 through 11 of Romans give us an overview of Christianity and beginning with chapter 12, Paul provides us with a practical reflection on that overview. So chapters 1 through 11, an overview of what it means to be a Christian. And in chapter 12, how to practice that which we learned in the overview. Or to say it another way, in chapters 1 through 11, Paul talks about what Christ did. Beginning in chapter 12, Paul talks about how we should live based on what Christ did. To say it another way, in chapters 1 through 11, Paul talks to us about God's grace through Christ. And in chapter 12, he begins to talk about our response to that grace. Note how verse 1 of Romans 12 begins, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God. God. That word beseech could be could also be said as the word exhort. I exhort you therefore brethren and sisters by the mercies of God. To exhort or to beseech is more than to request but it is less than to demand. 
It's somewhere between requesting and demanding when he says, I exhort or I beseech. Paul is saying, I urge you greatly or I encourage you greatly when you consider the mercies of God that you present your bodies as a living sacrifice. Are y'all with me so far? So then chapter 12, which is practical in its application and implication, is built on the theology of chapters 1 through 11. We get the theology or the theological in chapters 1 through 11 and then the practical beginning in chapter 12. What does that mean? It means, at the very least, that the theological always has practical implications. It is nothing to believe on God and in God if you cannot apply what it is you believe. The theological always has a practical side. The theological always has ethical implications. If you isolate the theology that Paul talks about in chapters 1 through 11, then you merely have an exercise in the intellectual and people just sitting around arguing about what they believe to be true about God. Theology is never meant to be isolated so that it becomes intellectual. Theology has ethical implications. If I believe something about God, then I am therefore called to behave in a manner consistent with that belief. There's a whole lot of folk believing but not behaving according to that belief, which means they got the theological but they don't have the practical. So we are called again to believe but also to, be to behave consistent with and based upon what it is we believe. Just to reiterate or to be a bit redundant, chapters 1 through 11 provide us with the theological. But the theological is nothing without the practical. There are ethical implications based on chapters 1 through 11. Now, what, 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 how does he begin to talk about the ethical implications? Notice he says, I beseech you, verse 1 of Romans 12, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God. What are the mercies? Everything that Paul talked about in chapters 1 through 11. Paul says, based on everything I've said, I exhort you, I beseech you, I encourage you, I urge you to consider all of the wonderful things that God has done in order to save you. And by considering all of those things, present yourself as an offering to God, a sacrifice, which is a reasonable act of worship. So God has provided certain mercies to us in chapters 1 through 11. Paul says in chapter 12, this should be our response to his mercies. Now, how would we characterize his mercies? His mercies are sacrificial. God has given himself, John 3 and 16. He has loved us so much that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. His mercies have been sacrificial. So since God has made sacrifices in our behalf, we should in turn make sacrifices to him as an act of worship, but our sacrifices are not worthy of his sacrifice if we don't completely give ourselves. That's why he says present your body, because if you present your body, then everything about your body goes along with your body. Present your bodies as living sacrifices, uh, holy and acceptable unto God, which is a reasonable act of worship. All right, here's, here's what we're going to be trying to do in this series. We want to talk about the fact that the pres the presenting of ourselves really begins with a fundamental change of mind. God has made sacrifices. Paul refers to those sacrifices as the mercies of God in verse number one of Romans 11. And so Paul says, if God has made sacrifices to you, you should make sacrifices to him. But the only way to make a complete sacrifice is to give ourselves completely and you will not see mm, the good sense in doing that without some fundamental transformation taking place. Yes, a fundamental transformation. 
a, a significant change in yourself is required in order to give yourself completely to God. And Paul describes that fundamental change as having our minds renewed. I want to give God my best because of his mercies, meaning he gave me his best. But I cannot see how to give him my best until I've had a fundamental change take place in my mind. Why does Paul call on the mind being renewed? Because Paul is talking about we need to reach a point where we learn how to process truth. Now, what does it mean to process truth? It means what you think about what you experience. What you think about what you experience determines or is the processing of truth. How, how can I put it another way? How you process truth determines the conclusion that you come to. How you perceive reality determines what you end up with after you've thought about a thing. Your thoughts process truth in a certain kind of way, whether you are of an unrenewed mind or a renewed mind. The processing of truth. Listen, if you, if you have a food processor at home, certain buttons determine how the food that's put in there is processed, whether you want to puree, whether you want to blend, whether you want to chop, whether you want to liquefy, all of those are dependent upon certain buttons. So the button you press determines the process that the food is taken, that the food is um, uh, handled with by the food processor or the blender. Paul is saying the same thing here. There are, there's more than one way to process truth, and the unrenewed mind processes truth differently than the renewed mind. Why does he say that the mind has to be renewed? Because wherever your mind goes, your life always follows. Yes. Hear me today. Wherever your mind goes, your life... And, and people mistake the order here. They think it's life, then the mind. Paul is saying, no, it's the reverse. It's mind, then the life. Where the mind goes, the life follows. You're hearing me today. We mistake the order. It's not life, then mind. People think all the time... If, I, if this thing changes, then my mind will be right. If I get hold of this, then my mind will be right. No, Paul's point is the mind has to be renewed first before the life takes on some difference in the living of it. It's the mind that Paul says matters here. What does that mean? Head first. Head first. Under normal circumstances, when a baby is born, the baby's born head first. The baby needs to be born head first. If the baby is not in a position to be born head first, then there are one of two ways that the doctor can go about taking care of that problem. If it's possible, he can go into the womb and turn the baby around and then deliver the baby head first. But the key is the birth is head first. If he cannot turn the baby around in the womb before it's born, then he makes an incision that is referred to as a C-section. And based on that cut, he's able to deliver, to bring out the baby head first. But the key is always head first. Meaning if you're going to be birthed into the new circumstance which you have been prepared for, it always has to be head first. And so spiritually speaking, God wants to bring us out of places that are old and into places that are new, but he can't bring us from the old to the new if we're not coming into it head first. You want to come out of stagnation? You want to come out of your limitations? You want to come out of a certain situation? It has to be head first. God says it's got to be head first. And if you're not positioned to do that, then God will reach in and reposition you so that he can bring you out head first. So God will cut your situation in order to deliver you head first. But it's always about coming out head first. You cannot graduate to new levels in your life without having a renewed mind. It's got to be head first. Paul says, and be not conformed, verse 2 of Romans 12, and be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the, what? Renewing of your mind. The implication is that everybody's mind needs to be renewed because we were all born with minds 
that need renewing. And what is it when, mm, when your mind is renewed? It is to have a different perspective on the, on the same thing. The unrenewed mind sees the same thing as the renewed mind. But the renewed mind sees the thing differently than the unrenewed mind does. It doesn't mean that your it doesn't mean that your experiences change or that you see different things than you saw before your mind was renewed. The unrenewed mind sees the same thing as the renewed mind, but the renewed mind has a different perspective on the same old thing. That means that the person with the renewed mind is now seeing his or her life from God's position and seeing him or herself from God's position. The renewed mind sees the same thing, but now sees it from God's position. If my mind is renewed, I'm not talking about myself and seeing myself like I used to see myself. The unrenewed mind says, you know what, I'm a slave. But the renewed mind says, I'm a son. The unrenewed, listen, with a renewed mind, I no longer say I'm sick and I'm trying to get well. I say I'm well, but I'm fighting the sickness. The renewed mind does not say I'm bound and I'm looking for liberty. The renewed mind says I've been set free and I'm fighting bondage. The renewed mind does not say I'm a sinner trying to be holy. The renewed mind says I'm a saint trying to fight against sin in my life. That's what the renewed mind says. I see the same thing, but I'm seeing it from a different position. Paul says, be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Why does everybody's mind need to be renewed? What's wrong with the mind? And why does the mind need renewing? A whole lot of folk would disagree with that, placing life first and then the mind, rather than the mind first and then life. Because many people would, would posit this. They would say, well, as far as I'm concerned, if you know better, then you do better. So the people who say, if you know better, you will do better, when they say that, what they really mean is the problem is that the problem with the mind is a lack of knowledge mm -hmm. or a lack of education. The people who say, if you know better, you will do better, are actually saying the problem with the mind is an absence of knowledge or an absence of education, which would mean that the problem with the mind is an information problem. But whole, the fact is a whole lot of folk receive the information, but it never makes any difference in their lives. The Bible does not say that the problem with the mind is an information problem. The Bible does not say that the problem with the mind is not uh, that you do not think enough positive thoughts. I understand the importance of information. I do also understand the importance and influence of positive thinking, but that's not the root of the problem with the mind. Listen to something that Paul says in Ephesians 4, verse 23. He says, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind. Listen to what he says, verse 23 of Ephesians 4, and be renewed in the spirit of of your mind. Paul says your mind needs to be renewed because of the spirit of your mind. It's the spirit. What does that mean? That means that we are born with a mind that has a certain posture towards God. We are born with a mind that processes experiences and truth a certain kind of way. Paul is saying that we are not just born with a view, we are born with a viewpoint. That we are born with a mind that operates according to a governing principle that is natural rather than spiritual. We are born with a mind that is hostile toward God and because we're hostile toward God, we, we conduct self-worship rather than God-worship. And the reason we're hostile towards God is because we were born with a mind that's hostile towards absolute authority and absolute sovereignty. We don't like to be told what to do. We like to create our own truths and we like to run our lives our own way. But the problem with that is 
that the mind that we are born with is hostile towards God, which always leads us into places of error and destruction. We are hostile towards authority and sovereignty. That's how the serpent was able to convince Adam and Eve to eat the forbidden fruit because they had a mind that was hostile toward God. And because they were hostile toward him, they were suspicious of the motives of God, thinking that the reason God set stuff up the way he did was to keep them from being all they could be. Because if they became all they could be, they could then rival God. It's a mind that is hostile toward God. We don't like being told what to do. Listen, think of your mind as a movie theater. When you're in a movie theater, the images you see are not random. They are, they are projected, they are programmed and then projected on the screen. Think, listen, listen, in the theater, the images you see are not random. They are programmed ahead of time and they are projected on a screen repeatedly during the day and repeatedly day after day establishing a pattern according to the images that are shown over and over again. Well, if you think of your mind as a theater, because of the fall of Adam and Eve in Genesis 3, the minds we were born with are programmed to project lies about God rather than the truth of God, which means we were born with a particular mindset and we need a renewed mind so that our minds can project truth to us rather than lies. Colossians 3 verse 2, Paul says, set your affection, your mind, on things above, not on things on the earth. But you're hearing what I'm saying today. In Romans 8 and verse number 5, Paul says, they, are, they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh, but they that are after the spirit, the things of the spirit. So the renewed mind sets its thoughts on things above and on spiritual things according to Colossians 3 and Romans 8. That means if my mind is renewed, I've made an exchange. If my mind is renewed, I'm exchanging lies for truth. If my mind is renewed, the difference is I'm no longer thinking naturally, I'm thinking spiritually. If my mind is renewed, I'm no longer thinking my way, I'm thinking God's way. And the difference is now I'm seeing the same stuff, but again, from a different vantage point. Ah, before my mind was renewed, I was looking for the approval of men and women because I believed the lie that human praise matters. Before my mind was renewed, I'd be depressed today, believing the lie that I could not overcome the mistakes and sins of my past. Hear me today. In Ephesians 4, verses 22 through 24, Paul says, put off concerning the former conversation, the old man which is corrupt according to the deceitful lust, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind that ye put on, and that ye put on the new man, put on the new man, which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. Paul describes having a renewed mind as taking off some clothes and putting on some whole different and new clothes. And he, he see, he describes he describes taking off clothes and putting on clothes as representing what it is to have a renewed mind because you're taking off the old mind and putting off the new mind, a renewed mind. Now, I'm almost done, but there's a question and an issue to consider here. How am I going to consistently operate with a renewed mind? The way I consistently do it is to confess and yeah. repent yeah. every day. Yeah. I operate with a new mind, a renewed mind, by confessing and repenting every day. I am putting off lies and I'm 
putting on truth. Taking off lies, putting on truth. There's some stuff that until my mind is renewed that I'm tempted to believe. With an unrenewed mind, I'm tempted to believe that I cannot change. With an unrenewed mind, I'm tempted to believe that I've got to earn my salvation by my works. Nullifying the precious blood of Jesus Christ. With an unrenewed mind, I get up every morning saying, you know what, it's going to be a bad day. With an unrenewed mind, I'm looking for things to bring me happiness and a sense of fulfillment. I've got to exchange the lies for the truth. I've got to say, I've got to confess these lies and repent of them. I've got to say as a result of a renewed mind that I am the righteousness of God through Christ. With a renewed mind, I've got to say to myself that my sins have been covered by the blood of Jesus because he died at the cross for me. With a renewed mind, I've got to quote Paul in Romans 8 and 28 and say, and I know that all things work together for good to them that love God and are called according to his purpose. The renewed mind says, you've got to take this thing seriously, Nesbitt. Your mind is not a playground. Your mind is a battlefield. Be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Now, I'm, 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 I'm almost done, but some would say, you know what? My mind is such a problem that I just don't feel I can control my thoughts. I want my thoughts to be proper. I want my thoughts to be renewed. But I don't feel like I can control my thoughts. But again, the Bible begs to differ. The Bible says it is possible to control your thoughts. Listen to Paul in Philippians 4, verse number 8. He says, finally, brothers and sisters, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, Whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report, if there be any virtue and if there be any praise, think on these things. Oh, Paul says it's possible to control your thoughts. Just stop thinking about what's true. Stop thinking about what's honest, what's just, what's pure, what's lovely, what is of good report. If there's any virtue in a thing that you can see, if there's any praise to be attached to something, then think on those kinds of things. I hear the psalmist say in Psalm number one, blessed is the man or woman that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly or standeth in the way of sinners or sits in the seat of the scornful for uh, in his delight is in the law of the Lord. And in that law does he do what? Meditate day and night. The Bible says it's possible to control your thoughts. The Bible says yes. Well, Paul says all of us need to have in order to live a transformed life and give God what belongs to him a renewed mind. A mind that's been fundamentally changed. Because until the mind gets, listen, you got the, listen, you when, you, when you go to bed at night, you lock your door. Because you don't want to let certain things, you don't, want, you don't want things, you don't want people who don't belong in your house to just walk up in your house and take control of a house that doesn't belong to them. Come on, somebody ought to hear me in here today. You don't want, you, you don't want walking into your house what does not belong in your house. And so you got to treat your mind the same way. You got to say about your mind there's some stuff that doesn't belong in my mind. I have to have a renewed mind in order, to come, in order to overcome the stuff that has no place in my mind because until my mind gets renewed, my mind will continue running errands for my flesh. 
And you don't want the flesh in control because that's called thinking from the bottom up. You want the spirit to be in control because you need to be thinking from the top down. Some people say it's difficult to choose a thought. You can't choose your thoughts. Well, if you don't choose your thoughts, that means your circumstance will choose your thoughts for you and you'll be letting folk in the building that don't belong in the building. Be not conformed to this world. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Where are your thoughts taking you every day? Are you depressed? If you're depressed, it means that you're not focusing on the presence of God in your life. And you are allowing the circumstance to speak to you rather than speaking to your circumstance. You cannot allow your circumstance to choose your thoughts. In John 11, I've got, to, I've got to quit here, but in John 11, Jesus stands at the grave of Lazarus and called Lazarus out by name. He said, Lazarus, come forth. And when he called Lazarus, he was calling him from the grave, meaning he was calling him from the darkness, calling him from the dark place, from the dark space. I'm trying to say to somebody that's hearing this message today that God is calling you out of the darkness mm, of a mind that has not yet been renewed. God is calling you from the darkness of depression, uh, the darkness of discouragement. He's calling you from the place where your thoughts are being controlled by your circumstance. Jesus called them from the darkness. Lazarus came walking out of the grave, but listen, it wasn't enough for Lazarus to come out because he came out with his grave clothes on. So Jesus said, well, he's out, but he's not in position to take advantage of what I've done for him. He said, take off his grave clothes. I'm trying to help somebody today. God is calling you not only to come out of the place of darkness, but to take off the old mind and put on a new mind. You, listen, you can be moved into a better place, but if you got the same old mind, you can't take advantage of the better place with some old thinking. God is calling you, not only out of the darkness, but to take off the clothes of an unrenewed mind and to be transformed by the renewing of your mind. I got a new mind because of the Lord. I got a new, listen, I woke up this morning. That's what the old folk used to sing. Woke up this morning with my mind. Stayed on the Lord. Yeah, woke up this morning with my mind. Stayed on Jesus. And then they would close the verse by saying, Hallelujah. 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 Because he's worthy. Of the praise, the glory, and the, if he's brought you out, you ought to give him praise. If he's changed your mind, you ought to give him praise. If you think differently than you used to, you ought to give him praise. If you handle stuff better this year than you did last year, it's because of a renewed mind. Give him the praise. Give him the glory. Yeah. The renewing of the mind is what we need. And you've been given an environment. Stop letting the bad stuff in. Stop letting those depressed and discouraging thoughts in. Because those emotions, the emotions that those thoughts create, make your day miserable. If you woke up this morning with your mind stayed on Jesus, then that means that his presence can guide and govern your thinking so that you can say, you know what? No, it's not going to be a, a bad day. This is the day that the Lord has made. And I'm going to rejoice and be glad in it. Wherever you are, come on, give him some praise. Perhaps 
someone who is watching and listening today has had a change of mind. You have heard the voice of God speaking to you today through the power of his word and the presence of his spirit. Now, Paul says, is the accepted time. Now is the day of salvation. Don't put it off. Tomorrow is not promised. Solomon says in Proverbs that one does not know what a day will bring. And since we do not know what a day will bring, why not take advantage of this opportunity now to connect with the promise of God? That promise is if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. This is your time, your chance, your opportunity. For those of you who are with us virtually, call us at 404-209-1423. Email us at contact at providencebc.com and we'll respond immediately. And even if God is leading you, as you sense the voice of the Spirit, to another fellowship other than Providence, that's not a problem with us. We only want to connect you with the one who can renew your mind. Yeah. Transform you by the renewing of your mind. Call us. Email us. The information is on your screens right now. We would love to connect with you and facilitate your wishes with regard to the kingdom of God and the body of Christ. We love you and we are praying for you and giving God praise for the decision that you make to have your mind renewed by his promise. Call us, email us, use that information today. Let me extend my gratitude to all who are gathered in the room today, particularly our music ministry, all of our technical people, and most certainly all of our members and guests that are sharing with us in this worship experience. I appreciate all of you. Thank you, all of you who, who uh, comment in the notification section on Facebook. Uh, your appreciation for the music ministry and the technical people. Continue to let them know, however you can, how much you appreciate the work that they do each week. Uh, we will be doing in-person worship again on the first Sunday of August. Please go to the website and register. Uh, we look forward to seeing you. And then the first Sunday in September, as things continue to improve, we are looking at returning to an every week worship schedule and other activities as well and we are meeting about those activities. Please continue to contribute. Uh, we want to complete the installation of the boilers as well as the remodeling of the chapel and uh, we need your continued support to do that. And let me thank many of you who made sacrificial donations last Sunday. I appreciate that. Some came in this week and they'll be counted with uh, today's offerings, uh, but thank you for your support. We have, we have been close to a year and a half now in this circumstance because we began around the end of March uh, with virtual worship, and uh, it's just been, it's been a trying time, but you know what? I'm standing here today, and you are looking at me today because of the sustaining power of God. How can we make it through this without a renewed mind? Some people have been so discouraged, so depressed, and have barely been able to make it through this. But God has sustained us all the way. And he's, he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. He's going to keep doing what he's been doing. So just hang on in there. Hold on. Yeah, a little while longer. That's what, that's what Deacon Harper sings. Hold on. It's a little while of everything. will be all right. What does that mean? That he's working all things together. Wow, well, good. Amen. God bless you. I appreciate you. Would you bow with me for prayer? Father God, we love you. We praise you for who you are, God. We thank you for the power of your word and the presence of your spirit. God, we lift up now every need that is related to providence and not just us, but those who are partners along with us, God. We pray that every need be met according to your riches and glory. We pray especially for those who are sick among us, those who are grieving, those who are shut in. Uh, we lift up, oh God, uh, 
healing and wholeness. We pray, oh God, that we might realize by virtue of our relationship with you that we have the great privilege of thinking thoughts that keep us, that surround us, that protect us, and that guide us. Thank you, God, for a renewed mind. Bless now, God, providence individually and collectively, we pray. And we thank you in advance, but we also thank you for what you've already done. In Jesus' name, the Lord bless and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance and give you peace. Amen. God bless you. Tomorrow morning, 6 a.m., prayer, Bible study Wednesday, virtual worship next Sunday. God bless you. Have a great day. Thank you.